You're listening to the Better for America podcast, presented by AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens. Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Weber, and this is your AMAC podcast, Better for America. Today on our show, we have Miranda Devine. Now, Miranda is a New York Post columnist and a Fox News contributor. I'm sure you've seen her on Fox. She also works for the Australian media as a Daily Telegraph columnist and Sky News contributor. Uh, She was born in Queens, New York. She grew up in Tokyo and Sydney, and she attended Northwestern University in Chicago. Miranda, thank you very much for being with us today. Pleasure, Rebecca. Thanks for having me, and hello to all your fabulous listeners. Wonderful. Miranda, I want to jump right in and get your thoughts on on big tech and media censorship, Uh, Mm. because the reason really why AMAC started this podcast and the reason why we launched our news app, uh, you can go right to your app store and download the news app, is that we saw that mainstream media and big tech were actively suppressing stories that don't fit their narrative. Uh, You yourself, I think, might have fallen victim to this suppression as well. (laughs) So my question for you is is really a broad question. What do you think the biggest stories uh, over the last 12 months that were censored on a grand scale? I'm curious um, what you think the American public needs to know and hear more about that that we're not hearing in mainstream. Well, look, I'll go um, first in a self-serving way to the New York Post story about Hunter Biden and his laptop. Um, Now, that was a legitimate story. It's been uh, confirmed multiple times since, including by Hunter Biden himself in his memoir and when he issued a statement after the election in which he said that he was being investigated by federal authorities uh, over tax evasion and, it turns out, a few other things as well. But... um, At the time, which was uh, mid-October, which was a few weeks before the election, two weeks before the election, um, when we published our story, we, you know, confirmed that it was a legitimate laptop and that the emails that we were publishing were legitimate and we confirmed them with other sources. Um, The story was a, a real and genuine news story and it had a lot of import for voters. Um, because what it did was it showed that Joe Biden, uh, contrary to his frequent denials, was involved in his family, his sons and his brothers' influence peddling operation around the world. At least he was aware of it and he was meeting people involved in it. And this is what many documents on the laptop show. And this was a pertinent point to bring before the voters before an election so that they could make up their own mind about whether they were happy with that in a president. So uh, the story, we uh, basically published it at 5am. Within two hours, we had Facebook and Twitter uh, had decided to censor it. And in fact, Twitter locked the New York Post account for two weeks up until four days before the election. Uh, Afterwards, Jack Dorsey, who's the boss of Twitter, said to a Senate inquiry, well, yes, that was a mistake. But it's a bit late to say it's a mistake after the fact. Uh, And we know from polls that if, uh, that, you know, half of Americans had no or more, had no idea about the story. And of those, the majority would have probably changed their vote had they known. So it was an important story, and it's what the media is supposed to do, is report the facts so that voters are armed with those facts before they go to the polls. And Big Tech uh, has shown absolutely no remorse. Uh, They, you know, we're not the only, uh, you know, that story is not the only thing that they've uh, suppressed. Uh, We know that Google um, is really unreliable if you uh, Google uh, most things they will, uh, especially if they're political or to do with the pandemic, they will tailor the results that you receive. And people um, think, I mean, I still fall into this trap. And when I search for something on the internet, uh, the, the results that I get reflect the reality. If you go to use another search engine, which is DuckDuckGo, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you find a completely different set of stories which come up. I remember Google in the early days was uh, pretty straightforward. Now it's biased 
in favour of left-wing or Democrat narratives. And that's really dangerous because we regard Google as being impartial. Now Google you can't trust. Um, and uh, there are so many myriad ways that uh, Twitter and Facebook shape the news that people receive without their even knowing it. Yeah, it's amazing to, to learn and to understand how the suppression of that story could have, had it not been suppressed, could have had it a whole whole different, uh, you know, end game as it relates to um, our president. Uh, perhaps Biden would not have been elected, in fact, uh, and, and, and you know, there are still issues surrounding uh, the integrity of our elections. So we're, we're watching that close, closely as well. But to make matters worse now, they, the American people just did not get the truth. And that leads me to my next question. Um, I'm excited for you to share with us information about your new book, Laptop from Hell, Biden, Big Tech, and the Dirty Secrets the President Tried to Hide. I think that's a great title. And it pretty much sums up the Hunter Biden scandal. Uh, what influenced your decision to write about Hunter Biden's laptop? Because I'm sure many people um, would have would have been, uh, you know, fearful, perhaps, uh, especially with Joe Biden at the time running for president, and now he's in power. So my question is, what motivated you? And do you think anything will ultimately come of this? Uh, do you think that? Um, I mean, he's been getting uh, Hunter has been getting a an out of free jail card. It seems every time he gets into some sort of trouble. Uh, but share with us your book and and what prompted you to write it. Well, look, I think the American people need to know what's on it. They need mm. to know the truth about Joe Biden and his family, the full truth. And uh, you know, I'm not doing this with any uh, malice. Uh, I'm really approaching it as a journalist, uh, there is a, just a voluminous information. I mean, there are tens of thousands of documents and photographs. Um, you know, there are voice memos, there are uh, board papers, financial documents. Um, it's, it's a treasure trove, but it's hard to capture that in news stories. You know, we've, we've plucked the eyes out of it, but there's we're still so much to, to find. I, I, I describe it as it's almost like mining uh, to go through that laptop, um, like gold mining, you find these nuggets of gold that you just didn't expect to find. And I think a book is the best way to describe it because there are lots of little clues um, to the the really egregious corruption that was going on with the Biden family in terms of monetizing Joe Biden's name in the countries, particularly there was some domestically, but mainly in the countries overseas that he had carried job when he was vice president. And, you know, two uh, obvious ones are um, China and Ukraine. Yes. And in China, it was so obvious. So this is what Joe Biden has done his entire career is leverage his influence uh, to benefit his family. And that started, you know, early in Hunter's career when he uh, left uh, college and was catapulted straight into a high-paying job uh, with a sign-on bonus with MBNA, which was a big credit card company in Delaware that was one of his father's biggest donors. Um, both both Hunter and his father also benefited from uh, really good real estate deals that uh, came to them thanks to MBNA uh, again. Um, and, you know, it, so on. And so every job that Hunter got was uh, leveraged through his father's sure. connections. And so th this is just a, a pattern in it, – it's so natural for them, they don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I genuinely believe they don't see that there's anything wrong. So that when uh, Joe Biden flew on Air Force Two into Beijing, he brought along Hunter, and Hunter was in the middle of doing these uh, multi-million dollar deals – um, or trying to with Chinese state-owned companies and, uh, in fact, a subsidiary of a Chinese bank. And uh, he came away from that meeting with a multi-million dollar deal um, with that bank. And uh, Joe Biden, who was supposed to be in Beijing to do America's business, to stop America from military, uh, stop China, I'm sorry, from militarizing the uh, islands in the South China Sea, from ripping off America's uh, intellectual property and so on, um, it came away empty-handed. Uh, 
on America's behalf, nothing was done. On the Biden family's behalf, millions of dollars of profit was done. So, um, you know, that, that's uh, something that the American people are, are aware of because there has probably been some reporting and then the New York Post's own um, reporting. But when you see the entire narrative from start to finish and all the evidence that is in the laptop bolstering it, uh, plus, uh, you know, I have the contents of the phones of Tony Bobolinsky, who you might remember was uh, a partner, business partner, former business partner of Hunter Biden, who uh, came forward yes. um, after our story and confirmed it and said that Joe Biden was the big guy who was getting uh, 10% of a cut of a deal uh, that Hunter Biden was holding for him. And um, and he gave those uh, contents of his phone to the FBI. I have them as well. And they form part of that jigsaw puzzle that you can put uh, missing pieces of the laptop together with the Bobolinsky material. And you get a pretty solid body of evidence that points to grave wrongdoing. And, you know, it may not end up in um, criminal charges because for various reasons, um, but it certainly adds up to moral wrongdoing, ethical wrongdoing. And um, that's something that I think people should know because Joe Biden has glided through his life with his self-narrative of being honest Joe, of being someone who is uh, against corruption in Washington. He is the epitome of corruption in Washington, of influence peddling. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I think that we need to know the truth. And we certainly knew the truth. Every barnacle that was on Donald Trump, uh, we were told about ad nauseum right. by the media. And yet Joe Biden is being painted as some sort of, you know, lovely, at worst, he's a, he's a dear old daffy man. Yeah. Um, and at best, he's a saint. Yeah. No, it really is, is, is shocking. Uh, it's, you know, it it does often feel like we're living in a in in, in an alternate reality because mm. uh, it just doesn't it doesn't make sense that um, so many people in in big tech and and media could turn a blind eye to the truth. Uh, and heck, if it's you know if if they want to argue that it's not the truth, then let's still have the conversation. But they want to pretend that it doesn't exist, and we see that in so many in so many areas. I'm going to talk a little bit about immigration shortly, but I want to first jump into. Uh, your thoughts on Liz Cheney. Yesterday, we saw that the GOP voted to remove Liz Cheney from her leadership role in the House. Uh, and Cheney spent an incredible amount of time bashing Trump. It seemed every chance she could get. Uh, I think she even took, uh, we have a video that I'll share, one last shot after she was voted out. Uh, I love your Twitter account too, Miranda. I saw that you put out a, a tweet essentially uh, saying that uh, it was the worst kind of self-engrossed, elitist, clueless self-harm a political party could commit, move on and ignore her. Um, so I agree with your statement there. So I think we can both agree that um, the GOP is better off uh, without her in that leadership role. Uh, I, I just, I want to ask you, why do you think uh, that she was so hell bent and had such, you know, a tunnel vision, uh, really blinded to everything and anything but uh, making sure that Donald Trump never came anywhere close to the Oval Office, as she states in the clip that we'll share. Good morning. Uh, we uh, uh, have had the, the conference meeting. Uh, I uh, am absolutely committed, as I said last night, uh, as, as I said just now to my colleagues. Uh, that we must go forward uh, based on truth. We cannot both uh, embrace the big lie and embrace the Constitution. And going forward, uh, the nation needs it. The nation needs a strong Republican Party. Uh, the nation needs a party that, uh, that is based upon fundamental principles of conservatism. And I am committed and dedicated to ensuring uh, that that's how this party goes forward, and I plan to lead the fight to do that. That former President Trump might end up back in the Oval Office. And what are you prepared to do to prevent? Uh, I uh, will do uh, everything I can to ensure uh, that uh, the former president never again gets anywhere near the Oval Office. We have seen the danger 
uh, that he continues to provoke with his language. Uh, we have seen his lack of commitment and dedication to the Constitution, uh, and I think it's very important that we make sure whomever we elect is somebody who will be faithful to the Constitution. Last question. Last question. Do you feel betrayed by today's vote? By today's vote? I do not. I think that uh, it is uh, an indication of where the Republican Party is, uh, and I think that the party uh, is in a place that we've got to bring it back from, and we've got to get back to a position where uh, we are a party that can fight for conservative principles, that can fight for substance. We cannot be dragged backward uh, by uh, the very dangerous lies of a former president. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey guys, Mr. Look, I'm not, uh, you know, I can't read her mind, but yeah. my um, suspicion is that uh, she's a Cheney. Uh, she's trying to avenge her father mm. and the Bush administration who really their their reign was repudiated by the Trump uh, reign because, uh, you know, the endless wars um, that they started uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan were front and centre of um, of Trump's sort of America first policy. And, uh, it, you know, that, the Bush administration made a terrible mistake uh, and, and the war in Iraq was that. And, uh, and, and then in Afghanistan. And so um, that now is clear. I mean, I supported it at the time, but we, at the time we didn't have the full information. And um, so uh, I think that the, the and, and also the fact that during that era, that was uh, the time when uh, we were offshoring jobs and China, you know, molly coddling China. So, um, it, it was a, it's an era that's been repudiated, and I think that's caused great consternation among the the Bush uh, era administration. And they now want to try and restore their reputations and um, and also restore their primacy over um, the party. And I think also that the the sort of insults um, to Jeb Bush by Donald Trump in his <laughs> usual fashion. Um, you know, during uh, during the Republican primaries yes. back then, um, also uh, really burned deep. So Liz Cheney will be getting a lot of positive affirmation from all of those, uh, you know, people that she would have admired uh, and loved. I mean, her father during, uh, you know, growing up and, and coming of age. And, uh, and so, and on top of that affirmation from the Never Trumpers, She's uh, being fated by the media. I mean, she has, uh, you know, interviews on NBC and yes. her press conference that which she, which she gave after being ousted as the number three most powerful person in the GOP um, was uh, just the most crowded press conference I have seen in a very long time in this era of COVID. Uh, it seems that uh, when it comes to to damaging the GOP, there is no problem with the pandemic when it comes to the Washington Press Corps. But um, I, I just feel with Liz Cheney that the whole narrative about her being ousted has been twisted, and no surprise, um, by the New York Times and Washington Post and CNN, um, because when, when this question of whether or not she should retain her position came up immediately after the impeachment, because, of course, she voted for impeaching Donald Trump, right. um, she won co comprehensively um, with two-thirds of her colleagues voting to re retain her in that role. Um, it was only, you know, now, several right. weeks later, um, that that she's been ousted comprehensively. Um, most of those people, almost all of those people who voted for her the first time, voted against her this time because she is not pulling for the team. Right. And she is doing damage to America's interests because the Republican Party is the opposition and they need to be together opposing these disastrous policies of the Biden administration. And there is just no time and no energy to be spent on just, you know, mopping up after spilt milk. The past is the past. Let it be. And, uh, you know, the, the other problem is Liz Cheney was not just content with uh, trying to trash Donald Trump, but she really was insulting and trashing Donald Trump's um, voters, which, you know, That's without right. them, the GOP doesn't have a hope. It may as well just fold up its tent and go home. And, yeah. you know, speaking of tents, I think 
you know, all of us would agree that the Republican Party is a broad tent. And I think that there should be room for people like Liz Cheney and Mitt Romney and so on, um, because there are voters who uh, who agree with them on whatever issues they have. Um, and so uh, you, you, you need to have room in a party for the broad church, for people of the left of your party and the right of the party, because you're then going to capture as many voters as you can. But you cannot have someone who does not represent the mainstream of the party in a leadership position. And this is the problem with Liz Cheney. And she seemed to really relish putting the boot in to Trump and basically the GOP's followers. I don't know what party she thinks that she belongs to, but... Um, she th- forgot you know, that she 75 can... million people or more voted for Donald Trump and that he is the most um, famous Republican in the nation, whether you like it or not. So I think uh, it was uh, Lindsey Graham who said there is no GOP without without Trump. Uh, and, and, you know, it seems that she forgot that somewhere along the way, uh, you know, it, 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 it um, I, I want to ask you, do you think Elise Stefanik, uh, Stefanik uh, she's running, right? She's, she's the number three spot in the GOP and expected to get the position? Uh, yes, she is. Uh, and she's been anointed by Donald Trump. I mean, the irony is that, in fact, on conservative positions, uh, Liz Cheney is uh, much more sound than Stefanik. Mm. Uh, you know, she's from New York. She's one of ours. I, I like her. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe she will evolve, uh, let's hope, but uh, she's certainly very articulate. Um, I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I always worry when, um, you know, these sorts of situations, I feel like the GOP always um, tries to bend over backwards to to choose a woman or, um, you know, to, to sort of bow to the political right. correctness. I hope that isn't the case here. Um, you know, she's new uh, and sort of untested. Uh, and it's a pretty important job. Um, but she certainly, um, you know, seems to be on the surface anyway, um, apart from her voting record, um, to be, uh, you know, pulling in the right direction. And she's a very good uh, adversary, I think, for the Democrats. And um, mm. and she does, she does sink the boot in in a very um, genteel way. So I think we can use some of that. Um, and I, I, she certainly won't be the nightmare that Liz Cheney has right. been um, in terms of, you know, trashing the the, the voters. And, and I think she'll um, grow and become very popular. Well, we'll watch and, and see what happens with that. Uh, I want to turn to the convers- our conversation to the disaster that we're seeing at the border, Miranda. Our members are very, very upset that the Biden administration just keeps insisting that there is no crisis uh, that the border is closed, which we, I can't imagine the border is closed. We see uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, coming over. And I think unless you live in a hole underground, uh, you hmm. you can't ignore the fact that there is a massive crisis at the border. And we've seen and we've heard the horror stories and we've seen the abuse of women and children. Uh, you know, it's human trafficking really on the rise. Just the other day, Miranda, human smugglers abandoned Five girls ranging from, I think, 11 months old to something like seven years old, found by a Texas farmer. Uh, I want to share a clip with those that are watching. No mother, no no mother, no father, no no, 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 no nothing. This is one of our uh, workers' wives right here taking care of this tiny one. No one with these children dumped out on the side of the river here on our farm. If this doesn't make you mad and want you to take to the streets, I don't know what will. So, uh, Miranda, this is a humanitarian crisis of unprecedented levels, right? A national security issue. So why? I mean, because I can't imagine that this isn't going to come back to really hurt the Democrats in the long run. Why does uh, why 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 is the Biden administration downplaying the whole thing and the borders are Kamala Harris that was supposed to visit the border. She never did that. Instead, she's focusing on the root cause of the issue, uh, sending money overseas to fix problems there instead of trying to fix the problems here in America. Uh, I think people are not only confused, but furious. So where do you see this whole thing headed? And uh, 
do you agree that this is, I, I'm sure you do agree that this is a big mistake, but how do you think that this thing is going to play out over the next year, for example, or two years, four years? Or decades. I That's mean, right. it, it's a catastrophe with such long-term ramifications mm. for America. It's hard to believe, uh, you know, even just the fact that uh, we have one in four of uh, the people coming over the border are being tested positive to COVID, um, you know, at a time when we have this extreme paranoia with Biden and his administration over, uh, you know, maintaining lockdowns and making children get vaccinated and, uh, you know, not allowing schools to open. Uh, there's, it's just open, open season for COVID coming across the border and who knows, you know, what kind of strains, uh, mutant strains are involved. Um, so that's the hypocrisy, number one. But look, if you look at uh, Joe Biden's uh, past um, comments on migration, he has always had a philosophy of anything goes. You know, uh, it, it's the philosophy he used in parenting as well. It's a very laissez-faire approach. Just let it all happen. See what happens. It'll be fine. It'll all work out. Um, so I, I think although he's not a cognitive, cognitively all there, I think that laissez-faire approach uh, permeates um, his administration. Um, and that, that's one reason. Um, also, I mean, in, in a very cynical way, uh, the, the Democrats see uh, illegal immigration as being their future voters. Uh, they you know, the bill that Nancy Pelosi has been shoveling through Congress um, on election reform, so-called, um, is, is, you know, about weakening any voter ID requirements and making it easier for illegal immigrants to vote. Uh, and we know how good the Democrats are at harnessing those votes, at ballot harvesting, um, and uh, that's what they did in 2020, and that's what they will do with these new arrivals. And we saw some of the people at the border um, wearing Biden T-shirts. Um, they've come because Biden sent out the message and the welcome mat saying that he was not going to impose the cruel policies of Donald Trump, uh, which were far less cruel uh, and weren't cruel at all, in fact, mm. um, far less cruel than luring with unaccompanied children and women uh, through a very dangerous um, area where they're prey to these cartels and, uh, you know, have to pay enormous sums of money to people smugglers, um, you know, have to give over their children. Uh, the the stories that we're getting from uh, Governor Abbott in Texas, not these aren't rumours, mm -hmm. Governor Abbott in Texas saying that Texas authorities have been uh, informed formally about sexual assault, you know, of, of children, um, rape of children uh, that's going on in those overcrowded centres um, and traumatised women who have been raped uh, coming across the border. It's um, just morally reprehensible that this government, the Biden administration, is inviting criminals to prey on these poor people. And you can't blame the people for wanting to come to America for a better life. That's right. Uh, yeah. But they they have to come the right way. And that's that's the process that the Trump administration put in place with a suite of border protection policies that were, you know, the architect was Stephen Miller, who is absolutely brilliant. And a part of that, the suite of measures was the Remain in Mexico right. policy, which allowed uh, asylum seekers with genuine, um, you know, reasons to seek asylum in America um, to to, you know, put their case rather than coming into the country and melting away and, and doing it the wrong way. There are, you know, America is a country of immigrants uh, and and th those who came here the right way um, fully resent the fact that their jobs and, um, you know, their, their standard of living would be eroded by people who decide that they want to jump the queue. And it's not to belittle or... To denigrate of the course. people who are coming over the border. You know, they're they're victims themselves. Yes. But uh, it, the the fact that um, that Kamala Harris was assigned on March 24 by the president to be his border czar, and she has not held a press conference. She has not gone to the border. 
She is not, she refuses to even talk about it other than in this very vague, ridiculous manner about, um, you know, solving root cause uh, in Guatemala and Mexico. Um, you know, Democrats can't even solve the problems of homelessness in their own cities. Right. How are they going to solve the problems of poverty in cities, in countries far away? It's 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 just absurd and it's being swallowed by a, a a willingly gullible media that sits there and and Kamala Harris laughs her tinkling laugh and and just completely wipes out any responsibility because she does not want to be associated with this disaster even though the administration refuses to admit that it is a crisis which is well beyond that now uh, it's a humanitarian disaster. It's a national security disaster. The drugs, the criminals that are coming across the border. Uh, you know, you just have to talk to the ranchers in Texas who are, have properties on the border. And, and you know, they, they are just desperate. They've never seen anything like this. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Kamala Harris does not want to have her reputation uh, burned by it, and she knows that she can brazen through because there's no, uh, you know, AOC rushing down to the border to weep outside these uh, kids in cages um, scenarios. Uh, we had we had children um, packed into these detention centres um, in in you know sleeping on top of each other. Yes, I saw. And now. And now Biden and his administration are boasting that they've solved the problem because <laughs> they've managed to to uh, get more efficient to facilitate the people smugglers because they're moving the the illegal aliens out of the detention centres on the border and sprinkling them around the country and um, begging from help that's, for that's help. That's not success. Yeah. yeah, from people like you and me. In other words, they're begging for help from from good good people, from foster parents, from. Uh, churches yeah. and, and communities and volunteer uh, and, you know, the burden, the financial burden of taking care of these children and assimilating them into schools is really going to fall on the shoulders of the American taxpayer. After all, someone has to pay for it or the good hearted people that just want to step up and do something because they care. I mean, we all have a heart and we care about these children coming over. But the way the Biden administration teased the whole thing up is is really it's I I um it's misplaced compassion and they think that people like me and everyone listening is going to say oh well they're right you know these poor people they need a place to go but we don't see them in a caravan heading to Venezuela they're coming here because our country is a great country and so America is not a racist nation America is a strong country with uh, people who love our nation love God uh, care about God. And don't want to see our values trampled upon. And this is why it's so good that you're speaking because um, and that you're taking time with us today, because those that are listening, our members are so passionate. They're, they're some of the greatest people, I think, in this nation. And we need to educate our family members, our children, our neighbors, our friends, and do it in a way that is um, that is loving but, and truthful. Uh, so, so I appreciate your perspective because uh, my fear is uh, that I worry about my children, my grand, my granddaughter. Mm. I have a grandbaby, and I worry about the future of our nation if something doesn't happen. I do pray that we elect better people in. Now, I I want to mm. remind people who are listening: it's important that they read the book, your book. It is important. It's their, it's our duty in a sense to know who we're electing into office. Uh, if Biden is here in 2024 for re-election, I don't know, you know, uh, really uh, how, uh, by, you know, his vitality, if it's all there and, and if he'll still still be uh, running for re-election, if he even makes it that far. But people need to understand who Joe Biden is and they need to understand who Hunter Biden is and how the Biden family uh, sort of covered up, how big tech covered up and how the media continues to cover up. Uh, the truth. So again, the, the, we're going to put a picture of your book up on the screen. It is Laptop from Hell, Biden, Big Tech, and the Dirty Secrets the President Tried to Hide. Miranda, my mother is going to get love this book. I'm going to send it over to her because she's uh, <laughs> one of those ladies who's very smart. 
and she can't believe that this story was suppressed and almost made to go away. She was blown away by that. So again, yeah. your, your courage to come out and, and to report on this is tremendous. I, I want to let you uh, leave you uh, with uh, maybe a parting thought for those that are listening. And again, I thank you. You've given us such great time today. Very pleasure. Really lovely to be with you. And um, I, I applaud uh, your your role in, um, I guess, bringing the truth to people. And uh, I know that, you know, there are a lot of Americans, uh, very, very, uh, a lot of our readers particularly are very concerned uh, and feel helpless at the moment um, because I think the pandemic has changed a lot of politics around the world and really given the left um, so much power uh, over the populace and sort of blown away um, a lot of freedoms that we almost took for granted. So I think also, uh, you know, it's been a perfect storm because at the same time, you've got these enormous, very powerful multinational companies in terms of Facebook and Google and, um, and Twitter even, uh, who, who control the flow of information. Um, and, and while journalism is really going through a crisis of its own, where uh, I feel that it, truth is no longer important, it's more the sort of agenda items of the left and uh, we have newsrooms now stacked with political activists uh, who who think that it's their role to uh, to brainwash and propagandize the public. And um, so I, I think we're really it's very important that people keep their eyes open and um, find sources of information that they trust and go directly to sources of information. Uh, and and also I think eventually we're going to. Uh, have alternate, um, you know, platforms for people to find that information because you can't trust, as I said, the traditional sources. Um, and and I think that's also sad because we really, that make, means us more, that we're more polarised as a nation. So my only last advice would be uh, watch Fox News but watch CNN, read the New York Post, but also be aware of what's happening in the New York Times. Um, because you need to know what the other side is thinking so that you can head them off because they certainly um, are, are dominant in the culture uh, now, but their big blind spot is that they uh, only listen to themselves. They're in their own bubble, whereas I think conservatives are aware of both sides, um, and that gives us power. Very good and excellent advice, and uh, we have to remind ourselves the power that one person can make uh, if you uh, and I encourage people talk to your children, talk to your adult children, have a conversation with your grandchild, bring up the story, talk about it, listen to people, understand what motivates people to to become interested because it is our job, each and every one of us as Americans, to uh, carry on the torch, if you will. Miranda Devine, thank you so much for being with us today. This was a, an incredible honor for me. I hope to have you back with us in the future again. And for all of you out there listening, this is your AMAC podcast, Better for America, and we look forward to having you back with us again next time. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Better for America podcast. To learn more about AMAC and all it has to offer, visit us at www.amac.us.